I asked Paddy to to do a you know to have a chat to us just to share some insights about um, obviously being a successful disc golf player. So I'll throw it over to Paddy, who's going to share some of his um, knowledge with us. Cool. Thanks, Ollie. There's a lot of tutorial stuff already about, you know, how to throw a disc. Um, so I'm not going to talk about that type of thing. Um, we thought it'd be better about uh, mentioning some other stuff that it's not talked about as much. Yeah, I've got like sort of three topics. Um, I talk a little bit about them, how it works for me, uh, the stuff that I've figured out. And then yeah, if you just ask me some questions, I'll be happy to answer. Them. Yeah, first off, a little bit about me though. Like most of you uh, kind of know me anyway, but um, my name's Paddy. I've been playing disc golf for um, just about eight years. Um, picked it up <coughs> in Geelong with the Geelong crew. And they accepted me and big warm arms. They're a great, great bunch. Started pretty slow and then I started to get a little bit better. I won the, uh, I think it was the 2014 Australian Champs in the Advanced Division and um, Sort of after that, I thought, all right, I'll, I'll go up into open. And I think um, since making that move, I skills developed quite a lot. And I got invited to um, play in the world team disc golf championships, which was in Vancouver. And since then, they, yeah, um, I've had a really good run of wins. And yeah, I've uh, won three Australian championships um, in the MPO. I've been to the US a couple of times. I've managed to, uh, when the Aussie Open was going here, I qualified for the US DGC and got to play play that. And I think I'm one of very very few Australians to actually play the US DGC or be invited. Uh, yeah, it was a pretty big honor, pretty fun, and pretty good experience. And yeah, so that's a little bit about me, but I try and grow the sport, you know, run some tournaments. But anyway, enough about that. Oh, I'm also sponsored by Latitude 64, I should say that, yeah. <laughs> um, shout out. So the first one I thought um, would be good to talk about is building a bag. Um, I see a lot with like beginner yeah, people coming into the sport. It's a lot, I remember when it was for me as well, I was looking through absolutely everything, basically buying everything online and just figuring it out, just seeing what kind of works. You know, I was like, everyone talked about buzzers, destroyers, T-birds, you know, the like. So yeah, I've got a stupid amount of frisbees. So over the years, I think it's it's taken a long time to actually get my bag to where I'm happy. Um, I think having a sponsorship really helped with that because I was then able just to focus on one company. Um, I'm really happy with my bag at the moment. I've sort of covered almost every shot. Um, and I think that's one thing people don't really think about when they first start out. They think about the disc and they get recommended discs. You know, you hear the buzz, you hear the destroy, you hear the harp. You know, you hear about these discs and people say, yeah, they're great, but you don't really, you know, it might not be the right disc to start with. First bit of advice I would say is actually think about the shot, the shot that you want, the shot that works for you, um, and then sort of ask people, hey, this is the kind of flight I'm looking for. What flies like that? Because I know the first destroyer I picked up was crazy overstable. And it took ages to figure out, you know, exactly how to throw it. And I probably hindered a few things there. Um, I've seen some people who are actually legitimately starting out with putters, mids, understable discs, and they seem to be developing a lot quicker um, in that way. So, yeah, I thought that was, that was probably a good, good bit of advice. Like, just think about the shot and then ask about what kind of disc suits that. Yeah, I know that when I... Like this is everything I carry around, I've got nothing else, but I know if I hit the course, whatever course it is, I've got every shot you need from, from putters all the way up to super overstable. So yeah, it's all there. Yeah, any questions about sort of building, building a bag? Yeah, how many moulds have you got in there? <laughs> Actually, yeah, so um, some people have probably read that like a lot of the pros, they sort of stick to fewer moulds mm. and then they beat in their discs. Great advice, I think. Like, I know for me, so one of my go-to drivers is um, Blister Pro. Best thing I like about this is it's quite a wide rim and it sits in my hand really comfortably. So I know, I just know how to feel. The feel is consistent. So I've got 
like three Ballista Pros at the moment. Um, and then if you go through some of my other discs, like they are sort of wide rim drivers, but different, obviously different stabilities. But like trying to stick to fewer molds, I think is good advice, but it does take time to beat stuff in. So I've been lucky that like Latitude have come out and done, you know, a couple of different plastics, but they're doing this like Opto X stuff as well in the Glimmer, which tends to be like super, like overstable. So it's kind of cool now I've been able to put these in the bag and take out some, you know, some more overstable discs and, you know, keep to um, the one mold. But yeah, I've got, I don't know, there's, there's probably only about six or seven molds in there really. But it's cool, like over three years I'll be, you know, like my heart, this thing, um, as you can probably see, that thing is beat like you wouldn't believe. Um, and it's actually like now understable. That's taken at least four years to do that, but bam, then I've got that and I just put a brand new harp in. Yeah, definitely like work on your disc. If it starts to become a bit understable, keep it in the bag and just buy a new one. And then you've got same mold, same feel, but two different shots. How many putters do you have? Like putting putters? Putting putters, I really, I ca like I carry two with me. Um, I putt with daggers. But I'm only putting with one. Maybe I quite haven't developed it just yet, but I know people who will carry a spare putter in the same mold, um, but maybe it's a bit more beef. So a little bit more unstable and they'll use that for longer putts. I really like the concept of that. I think it'd be pretty handy to have. Um, I just haven't beat this in quite enough yet. And one silly little thing as well. I carry two putters because I warm up with two putters, but sometimes you feel Maybe one, and this this isn't uh, evidence based at all. But you feel like one colour's working a bit better for you, um, or that orange one just yeah. feels good in the hand. So you know it's there. Yeah. You say you say more than two putters. Do you do you have more practice putters? Like do you have do you have any other putters that you practice with, like off the course or? Oh, well, uh, at home, yeah, yeah, I've got a stupid amount of putters yeah. um, that are just sitting in my front yard. But when if I'm going down to the course, maybe I'll chuck one other putter in, but yeah, if I'm just doing, even just a practice round, two putters. Like if, if you want to just touch on putting quickly, um, you know, the best practice you can probably do is at the course, putting with the putters that you use. And try and keep it to what you're actually using in your bag. Even though they're the same moulds, sometimes they fly differently. And if I'm at home and I'm just putting in the front yard, there's a whole lot of different winds in my front yard. I'm just, it's, it's not the right practice. Like it's hard to say, right, that works fine for the yard. And then taking that out to the actual course, it's two different things. Like you'll get winds different, the landscape's different, everything's different. And especially with Poimena, I mean, you know, that elevation, you've got the best sort of practice that you could have out there. So yeah. Um, like it's good for if you just want consistency, obviously like at home, you know, you've got half an hour in the evening, smack, you know, get the basket up and smash a few parts and just to get that feel. But if you want to actually, you know, if you're leading up to a tournament or something like that, I'd be heading to the course and practicing there. That might actually be a good segue for the next sort of point I was going to talk about. And that's, um, like preparing for and playing tournaments. As I say, I've been playing tournaments for eight years. Um, gone from rec through to MPO. You know, one simple thing, like always carry a towel in your bag, or at least two. Um, me being a nurse, I always carry a first aid kit. But stuff like when you're out, I know for, for Poimena, I'd be definitely chucking some some snacks in, like the little, those gels that you can get from the supermarket, and, and water, like just keep hydrated, like hydrolyte, that type of thing, and an umbrella. Even if, you know, obviously rain, that's you know, no brainer. But for the sun, too, yeah, take care of your body, essentially, um, is good prep. Obviously, always look at the weather, like, you know, getting the right shoes, getting the right, like, finding a good raincoat to play in as well. I reckon I've been through about eight or nine different raincoats that I actually feel comfortable throwing in. It's such a hard thing to find. And then getting one that, like, if you do get a bit hot while you're playing, that it kind of breathes, it's just, it's, yeah, super difficult, but if you find the right one, it just makes your round that much better. 
gloves, hand warmers, like little, you know, just those little things that maybe you're like, oh, maybe I don't really need it. But once you have it and once you're out on the course and, you know, if it's cold and you've got warm hands, it's amazing. And that's maybe what your competitors aren't really thinking about. Other thing about prepping for tournaments, my three P's before I start a tournament. P, part, poo, in that order. <laughs> <laughs> all right. I know even I like I get a bit nervous. We all we're up early. We're having a couple of coffees. It's probably good to you know making sure there's toilet paper in the dummies as well. So. Oh, and one thing, um, stretching. Yeah. It's just so important. Just you know warming up, stretching. Um, one other thing I do carry in my bag all the time is the um, elastic mm -hmm. as well. Yeah, very underrated. I also carry the lacrosse balls. That you can get from Aldi for like five bucks. Great for knocking out your disc from a tree and great for a roll afterwards as well. And foam rolling is always good. I usually able to fit that in a suitcase. But yeah, um, take care of your body. It's, yeah, it sucks not being able to play. Cool. Do you have a warm up sort of routine that you, yeah. you do every time or you just sort of go with the flow depending on what's going on? Or? I mean, warm up's always different, really. I um, mean, stretches. Stretches are stretches. I don't know what um, what issues where I'm normally tight. Like I'm like in the hips, um, glutes. You know, are big for me. So I'm trying to and lower back. Trying to very, very um, be much more aware of that and warm, warm that up properly. As far as like warming up to play, it really depends. Like I might have a few putts and see how that feels. If that kind of feels alright, then I'll have a few drives. If they feel okay then I might go back to one. If there's something where I'm not feeling really comfortable in, I'll focus on that until I feel comfortable with it. We all know what like the first forehand of the day feels like. It feels like crap. So I try and get a few forehands in, a few backhands. It does depend on how much time you have as well. I mean, I think if you're there with less time, um, I'd probably, me personally, I would stick to putting. What about um, like any kind of cross training outside of disc golf? Yeah. Yep. Um, one thing I've been kind of thinking about, uh, and doing a little bit, but you know, with stretching wise, like doing some yoga. My wife does a bit of Pilates, that so doesn't do anything for me, but I've been following a few things, like I'm thinking, oh, maybe we should do that. Yeah, I know some friends like Jareth um, Sweeten, he's a um, Latitude teammate. Um, he's been doing a lot of like gym work and stuff like that, and just a lot of strengthening, super important. Um, I, I used to hit the gym quite a lot and I've sort of slowed down a bit with that now but uh, with like these little back tweaks I'm kind of thinking about I need to get back into it and start doing some actual you know some weight training and stuff with it and yeah last thing um, mental game obviously super important uh, I think my mental game when it's on I feel like it's um, it's pretty strong and I'm pretty confident in my abilities there's definitely been times where I've come through and um, had quite a lot of internal battles going on and got through that sort of that period and actually then come out on top. But that's taken a long time to kind of get to. But there's just like little tricks, you know, I'm always learning on the go. Little things I've picked up along the way. I remember Dave Bandy. Um, so a few people probably know that name, a few people won't. Um, he's one of the Perth boys, he's been playing disc golf for oh, well over 10 years. Um, he used to win everything back in the day. If you ever look at a Perth Open trophy, it's just Dave Bandy. Yeah, he's a very calm guy on the course. He doesn't really sort of say much. He's sort of the big, lovable bear. Uh, but he said to me, once I was um, just got in my own head, I was, I was pissed off. I was um, kind of bleeding on a few holes. And um, yeah, he just said, oh, just look up, just look up. just." Look at the trees, look at the wind, you know, just take a time, just look up and realise what you're actually doing. Like, you're just out on the course throwing frisbees, it's, it's not that stressful, it shouldn't be that stressful. Um, so yeah, like often when I'm out there and, you know, if I'm not playing as hot as I want to be or whatever, um, yeah, I'll just, just look up. Um, yeah, it's just a little moment, just maybe that brings you back, um, but you don't have to do that, but if something just sort of brings you down like you know um interrupts that crappy thoughts then yeah try and figure out what that is and just do that i mean 
I know I definitely play better when I'm feeling calm, when I'm positive, when like literally I'm just out there having fun. Like I feel like I'm just down at Barn Valley in Geelong, just having a little practice round. When I'm like that on the course, then yeah, that's when I've sort of played my best golf. So just try and yeah, work it to the positives. Um, and one little thing with making it positive, um, I think is, is goal setting. I mean, you can come into a tournament and just be like, right, I want to win it. I want to win the tournament. And then what happens? Okay, so what happens if you don't win? Then it's like, okay, well, you know, then you go back and you're looking at little things that you think you did well. Well, you think you did good. I know one thing with me, I always look back on the negatives and shouldn't be doing that really at all. Sometimes I've shot, you know, a really hot round or the hot round and then I'll come in and be like, yeah, but I missed that par on hole nine. Could have been this, could have been that. And I think like chemically in our brains, obviously if something negative happens, it's like 10 times as you know, potent as when something positive happens. So I think, um, yeah, if you're out there, you know, maybe you've been working on your forehand or maybe you've been, you know, if you're local, you've been working on one hole or something like, yeah, I want to birdie that hole or something like that. Like make some smaller goals. And then if you hit that, be like, yeah, all right, well, you know, I was, 10 strokes off the lead, but damn, I hit that, you know, I made sure I birdied that hole, or I was really happy with my putting, or, you know, some small little aspect, take that out, and I think, then your next tournament, that's what you'll be thinking about, like, well, I was really happy with that, with my putting, so. During a tournament, every round's different, don't ever think about what you did yesterday, unless it, like, you know, you've got a game plan, like, you know, you threw forehand on that hole and it worked, okay. Maybe three forehand didn't work. Try and stick to like a bit of a game plan. Um, don't be like, oh yeah, but I bogeyed that hole yesterday with a flick. Yeah. You know, it's gonna happen again, you know. Or I birdied this one when you step up to it in the next round, like, well I birdied it in the first round, I'm gonna birdie it again. Like, never works like that. Every round's different, clean slate. Um, I've definitely done that. I've definitely had practice rounds where I come out and be like, oh, I shot 10 down. Sweet, that's easy. Now, you get to a tournament, you know, environment, you got stress on, you got other people, you got your card, maybe you're on a mixed card and you're playing with people who are, you know, not in your division and they're a lot slower and the pace changes, you know. There's so many different things can, that can affect it. So never go into a round, um, or the less expectation, I think, the better. I've definitely had that a lot and I'm glad this is going to be on film. Um, last Perth Open, I played a, um, a round with Chris Finn. And we, we played the um, Perth Open layout and I was, we were just, you know, it's a warm up round, but he shot like, I don't know, he was like 10 or 11 under. He beat me by like eight strokes or something. And he texts uh, Fergie the next, you know, that evening. He's like, oh, I'll beat Paddy by eight strokes today, you know? So he's building expectation, you know, and then destroyed him during the actual tournament. Like, <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> but no, it's like, yeah, I've definitely had those, those warm-up rounds where you just, you know, you're nailing shots without any stress and you think, mm -hmm. well, I, you know, it's good, you can do it, but when you get to a tournament, yeah, try and leave the expectation out. So how do you do that then from, you hit a birdie previous day or the practice, how do you stop from getting to the negative when you've stepped up to that hole and maybe, maybe you bogeyed it? Mm when previous day you birdied it, how do you then quickly snap out of that for going into the next hole? I'll use a practice round to, to make a game plan. So I know, you know, if I, I, I practice a hole, I'm like, okay, this is a forehand shot, that's the best percentage shot for me, I'm comfortable with that, confident with it. I'll do that. I, I might practice and be like, okay, yeah, I'm hitting the line, I'm birding it in practice, I can do that in the tournament. Get to the tournament, you bogey it, like you are saying, um, I mean, so long as I like, I stuck to my plan, I mean, you, you don't know, you might mm. just come out a little early, a little late, you might hit a tree, you might, you know, the wind might be wrong, you might just be off just a little bit. It doesn't matter, you can't go out there, unless you're Paul Macbeth, who's like done it a few times, you can't, even his like 18 under rounds, he's still, he's not going 18 birdies in a row, he's still hit a putt, mm. you can't hit 18 putts, it's just, it's unrealistic, you can't hit 18 birdies, like... So that's what I try and think about. Like, 
you make a game plan and then you get to it like and then it's one shot at a time I catch myself doing it a few times I might stick up like stand on a hole and then I'm thinking about the next hole like yeah well I can birdie this but that next one like it doesn't matter about the next one it matters what you're doing right here mm -hmm. right now when it comes to the game plan do you when you step up to the hole in tournament are you trying to visualize a particular shot and how much is that grounded in I guess like a hypothetical versus like a particular time you, you nailed it in practice. Yeah. I mean, no one knows your game better than you, but you step up to a hole, you, you already, I think like first instincts is a big thing. And I, I don't know how many times I've like stood up to a hole and like, mm, yeah, forehand, feeling it. And then maybe I'll talk myself out of it. I'll throw a backhand and then I'll stuff it up. And then it's kind of, oh, yeah, you should have just stuck with your first instinct. Um, and then vice versa, I've gone back and I'm like, you know, talk myself out to it, but no, no, first instinct was the forehand, just go, just do it. Confidence is a big thing. When you stand up there, you like, you look at the line. I, I, I've heard a lot of people talk about percentages when you look at a hole, but it's what you're almost confident in. Like I think up at Point Mina, hole three. Nearly everyone I see on that hole takes backhand. It's so like backhand, 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 backhand. So I, I step up and like, okay, backhand. I'll throw a backhand. Such a tight line, super hard to actually execute it. And I, I don't see many birdies on the backhand. Like you see them, but you don't see many. When you've got the forehand, which is bam, it's right there. So it's like, I'm confident in my forehand. I, I practice the forehand you know, in practice. So why am I stepping up and just thinking, bam, that's what it is, you know? And I've, I've not birdied that hole by talk, talking myself out of it too many times. Like, it's one that I'm kind of like, now I want to birdie that hole. But yeah, it's just standing up to, you know, analyze the hole, analyze the shot, what you're confident in, and then just execute that. If it's, yeah, if you stuff it up, then you stuff it up, it's fine. I try, try and stick to a game plan, but if what I'm feeling is confident on the actual day, then that's what I'll go with. So Katie, one of the things is you're very, your psychological mental game is outstanding. It's just, it's amazing to watch. What are you thinking about when you're standing there and you have a big putt to win a tournament? I, I know this scenario would have occurred multiple times and you just look calm as hell like there's nothing <laughs> right now. And you just nail it and you're like, cool, what's going what's, on? Uh, yeah, what's going on the outside doesn't reflect the inside. All right, in exact, when I was in New Zealand, um, so I won the New Zealand champs, and that was that was one of the biggest battles. I literally won it on the last part, um, playing up against Simon Feezy, who is a very good competitor, very strong mental game. Um, it's funny when you you pick up on little sly things like people say, you know, like just like how there's some people who are so good with their mental game, they'll try, you know, um, but Feezy is amazing competitor, amazing competitor. And um, I think I was like two strokes up and he came, like, he just did ridiculous stuff to actually come back and tie. And then I think we were, we were tied going into like the second last hole. And he, he was parked for a birdie to actually get one up. And I had about a 15 meter putt on a raised basket into a headwind. And again, I think it comes back to a bit of confidence, but well, I stood at the putt and looked at it. Like, yeah, okay, there's a headwind. Yeah, okay, there's, there's this, it's all going on. But I try and break it down, break it down to be simple. And then I think saying that you can do this, like, I know you can do it, you've done it before, just give it a chance. And then, yeah, see what happens. I know with that, like, I, I hit that putt, it was ridiculous. Um, and all the Kiwis were not happy that I hit that putt. <laughs> Boosting yourself up, finding that little confidence in, in just little things maybe that might help you at that point. Like it's taken, I've had some success and had some wins. So, you know, I've got confidence from those wins as, you know, but I still like don't win every tournament I play in. So it's, it's knowing the stuff that you can do, but um, yeah, just maybe trusting, trusting yourself to do what you know you can do and just, keep out of it like maybe some little mental tricks um like maybe like you've probably heard about it but focusing on one sort of chain um one link 
um, you know, the whole aim small, miss small type thing. I can see there's a bit of merit with that, and if it works for you, it works for you. Um, for me, especially with putting, breaking it down, breaking your putt down to something super simple. So sometimes all I'm, literally all I'm thinking about is the angle of um, the nose when I'm out. Because I, you know, I hate nose down putts. It drives me insane, and it doesn't give the putt a chance to actually go in. So I might be sitting there thinking, all right, you know, when you're going to release it, you're going to give it nose up. That's it, and you're going to put it on a line. So when it's out of your hand, like I, I might be aiming just from me to here. That's it, and then I've just I've done what I can. It's hopefully you know it it sort of hits. For me, when I was winning, you know, hitting that putt to win over Feezy, like Feezy missed his putt and then I hit mine. Yeah, it's definitely like you get a little bit of tunnel vision type thing, but yeah, I, like that's all I think about. Try and put it on that line, try and make sure it's nose up, and then visualize. give it a chance. Visualize it? Not so much, no. Um, I mean, I kind of like try and, you know, obviously pick the line a little, but like I said, I'm not looking at the whole thing from these points. So I'm not seeing rings or a line as such. I'm like, I'm aiming about here to here, like bowling. Like if you ever go bowling and there's the black arrows, yeah. like that are a meter in front of you. That's it. That's all, you, that's all I'm doing. Yeah. And sort of focusing on making sure you're doing the commitment. Because I think I find when I miss a lot of the putts, it's because I think about it so much that I just kind of half do it yeah. instead of just mm. trusting myself to, to do the full commitment. I mean, I, I guess, would you say that applies to pretty much the entire game is just making sure that you're... Yeah. I think mentally you're committing, like... One thing I always tell myself is, like, give it a chance. Yeah. yeah. Like, I hate missing low. I hate smacking it straight into the, to the cage. You know, I hate nose-down putts. You know, if I if I'm miss sort of wide, if I miss a bit high, if I'm hitting the top of the basket, Whatever, I gave it a chance. Be confident as well. I know, like, if you're looking at a death putt, especially at Point Mina, there's death putts on every bloody basket. Um, don't think about what's going to happen. Like, I mean, maybe be smart. Don't be like sitting there with a 20 meter thinking, yeah, and it's a big headwind. And you're like, I got this. Like, yeah. Yeah. yeah, be be calculated, but you know, be be confident. Be like, okay, like, you know. Give it, yeah. Is that Keep your part. Don't think, all right, this is going to clang into the bottom, then it's going to roll, and then, geez, I'm going to have like a 40 meter comebacker, and then, mm -hmm. or what do I do? Do I do that, or do I like maybe take the putt again and just lay up? Like, don't worry about that. Just remove like, the doubt. Give it a chance. Even though, like, and that's when I like to focus on those small things. Like, okay, just get the nose up, just get a bit of spin on it, and just get it on the line, and then whatever happens, happens. You reckon so, that's similar to driving through a, a gap like on what's that hole 16 is it but with a long mm -hmm. corridor yeah like because obviously there's so much there that it can get into your head are you just sort of like trying to block that out and just know that if i throw my shot that i know that i throw it's gonna go yeah i mean like if you're in an open field how often do you like you know that that gap it's only what like 30 meters long it's not that long it's massive <laughs> 300 meters at least <laughs> I mean I know I've definitely like disced down in that scenario um, and be like well okay I'm throwing like a putter or I'm throwing this I know it's not gonna I'm not gonna get some crazy flip or some you know massive kick or whatever it still happens but I know maybe if I'm throwing, like if I throw it a bit too low, it might just kind of settle. So I think it's but like a big thing with that. I've stepped up to that drive, I'm like, yeah, I'm going to hit this. I'm going to, you know, get a big driver. I'm going to just smash this gap and, you know, just be confident with it and, and hit it. I've also done that and skip 30 meters into the rough. Like it's, when I'm like throwing accurately, I'm not throwing with power. I might throw at 70, 80%, I think, you know, just for that hole as an instance, like when I'm coming through, and I know like there's tutorials against this and stuff, but one thing I'll try and watch my release point. Um, so, okay, well, I know 
sometimes when I'm throwing with power, I won't watch my disc, and then I'll be like, oh, why did it finish out there? Like, because I'm trying to throw it too hard, and I'm not focusing. So if I'm going for purely like something accurate, I'll sort of try and watch it at this release point, I'm like, all right, well, there it goes. Like, that's where it needs to go. That's the straight line. So, yeah. Or sometimes I throw forehand because I can visualize that line so much better. I'm looking right at it. That's a good thing with like upshots as well. Like try and learn a flick. If you don't have a flick, learn it. But yeah, if you're upshotting, you're looking directly at your target where you need to be. Like I think that's one thing that's, you know, maybe very successful is like I throw a forehand really well and I throw a backhand really well. You know, you've got to have both shots. Like, yes, okay, like you can be a James Conrad and still kill it with putters and whatever, but I know a lot of those shots that he executes are the lower percentage shot because he doesn't have a forehand. Like, it'd be so much easier just to get your fuse and just bam, there it is. Might be boring golf, but it works. So. There's a question on um, putting, which you were talking about earlier. Do you have a, do you have a comfort zone? Like, like with, I know yeah, about was, two feet. Comfort <laughs> 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 zone. So when you were talking about like the, the release point, like where and yeah. things like that, and, and like when you commit to a part, do you do you have a comfort zone? Like, is it is it the ten meter circle? Is it you know? I mean, like I've never been hundred percent inside circle one. You know, it's. I think it all comes back to where you're practicing from. Sometimes when I practice, I'm like outside the circle. That's fun. It's fun to practice from there. It's fun to practice at 20 meters, like, and see if you can hit one out of your 20 putts. Like, so if I'm doing that more, like, then yeah, obviously I'm probably gonna feel a bit more confident from further out. I mean, I've hit putts from 12 meters, and then I've gone to three meters and taken twice the time to line it up. It's like, well, I could miss this. You know, stuff like that, you know, just be bad to miss from two metres. Yeah. But yeah, I, I don't think there's, apart from the two feet radius, there's not really a comfort zone, it's more where you're practising from. Sometimes when I warm up, I might, I won't go straight to 10 metres and then start putting. I might go to two metres um, and then start hitting that. Like, okay, all right, there it is. And start walking back a bit further. There it is. That's the, you know, and then doing that and then go back and try a few 20 meter putts because, yeah, because it's fun. <laughs> so when you have, when you're out of your, say, comfort zone, and obviously it comes back to confidence, but do you then go back to a better percentage shot? Or would you be like, oh, I'm throwing my back in really well. I know it's less percentage, but I've just nailed it in the last three holes. I'll go for that. Or would you say, it's sort of borderline of, of which do I go for, so yeah. forehand or backhand, what would you go then? The percentage or whatever you just been comfortable in that day? Why, like things that really impact it for me is c because I'm confident with both shots, mm. uh, it might come down to like my confidence in that moment, what I'm feeling more and that first instinct, yeah. but also wind. Yeah. Um, like if I'm feeling the backhand, but I've got like a right to left and you know, there's risk or whatever, like, okay, well, I, I'll throw a forehand, you know, because um, I could use that wind better. So, yeah, it, it purely comes down to the actual hole, what risk is on the hole, wind, mm -hmm. that type of, and that first instinct. But, yeah. yeah, I won't be like, oh, I'm throwing the backhand super well. Like, I'm just going to throw a backhand. Yeah. Um, yeah. How do you get your beard looking so good? Uh, <laughs> professional <laughs> advice. Uh, and my wife. Yeah. Ooh. The beard helps, it makes you pipe better. <laughs> if you could give anyone advice that's going to be watching this, like new up and coming player, um, from like where you started to where you are now, what would be the biggest thing that stands out to you? Um, Don't say throw latitude. Throw latitude. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, no, I'm not going to say that. Um, definitely one thing, if like if I look at the span and where I've had success. Yeah. Um, it's definitely been when, you know, things off the course have been good, like I've been happy, been confident, you know. Yeah. When I've seen, I've seen people break down, I've seen people really not play well and just be really unhappy with disc golf. I think try to leave that off the course. I mean, you know, we're all going to 
shank into a tree, we're all going to lose this, we're all going to miss pass, we're all, like, it just happens, like, but you're out there doing something you love, like, just try and be positive on the course, and just be, like, have fun with your friends, like, I've been really lucky with the Geelong Club, I've been a part of team sport for 10 to 15 years, and I hated going out onto the pitch and thinking, right, we're going to kill these guys, like, you know, and like actually like having those thoughts, you're going to go out and actually injure someone, like, you know, if they annoy you, like, it's terrible, like, I don't want to be like that, I want to, you know, but then I started disc golf and like, you know, you see your mate nail a knife, uh, nail a line or crush a drive or hit a putt, you're like, yeah, man, like, that was <laughs> freaking awesome, like, I had people, you know, come up and, you know, yeah, great drive, you're improving, like, I think... Um, yeah, just, just being super positive out there is probably huge. And that's why I've stayed in the sport. So, yeah, I've got to say, if you're watching this, like, yeah, you can buy, buy all the frisbees you want, buy all of it, you know, buy Latitude 64. But, yeah, just, just go out, go have fun, go talk to people, go say good day. you know, if someone's rubbing you the wrong way, then go somewhere else. Um, you know, but I think everyone's pretty positive. Everyone's just out there to have fun and yeah, and just have fun on the course. So, yeah, and good things happen. Disc golf giveth. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Cool. Any questions? Yeah. Thanks, buddy. All right. Thanks, guys.